Hello everybody, in this lecture we will analyze uh, air cargo operations, which entail a substantial yet sometimes uh, hidden part of airline operations, or at least of those primarily focused on uh, transporting uh, passengers. The lecture is divided into three parts. In the first part, we'll be uh, covering air cargo operations from a general perspective. So in terms of supply chain, uh, stakeholders, main characteristics, and similarities and differences between the passenger uh, counterpart. Then we'll dive more into operations research in the second part by describing a fleet assignment model where cargo requests and uh, aircraft types can move simultaneously in a, in a cargo network. Uh, finally, when uh, assessing some of the limitations of the fleet assignment model, we'll uh, dive into column generation, which is a different uh, solution technique that is very suitable for a very specific type of problem within uh, uh, operations research, and this is one of those uh, problems. In terms of program, we'll deal with the uh, tactical planning, so with fleet assignment, and in terms of operations uh, research, we'll deal, not surprisingly, with some MILP models, with a multi-commodity flow problem, and in the context of column generation, with the notion of a shortest path. In our planning framework, so where all the different pieces of the course fit, we are indeed in the uh, tactical decision-making. So we are here. We are also doing some timetabling uh, in the model because it's a fleet assignment model where we also decide which flight legs to fly. So it's a, there's also some uh, scheduling involved. But one difference between the fleet uh, assignment you saw for passenger operations is that in the model we'll, uh, we'll be dealing with here for cargo, we are taking decisions now for uh, dispatching a fleet maybe in one week from now. While for passengers, you do fleet assignment uh, months before. And the reason for that, or the reason why for cargo we are using such a short uh, time frame between when taking decisions and when those decisions need to be implemented, uh, this short time frame is because for many uh, airlines, most of them actually are dealing with cargo, the booking window to, 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 to order a request on a specific flight opens no sooner than two weeks before the actual departure. While for passenger operations, as you as you all know, you can today you can buy your ticket for well next year this we are in November, so it doesn't really sound right, but you can buy your ticket now for exactly one year from now. So the time frame in that case is much the time window is much wider. So we are still dealing with tactical uh, with a tactical level, but it's much closer to the actual day of operations. So let's start with the air cargo operations from a very general and broad perspective. Just to give you some, some insights, on a normal day of operations, roughly 140,000 tons of cargo are transported via air. This sounds like a, a very large number. This is a lot of cargo. And in terms of what this cargo could be, we can have, you know, handwritten letter which needs to go to the other side of the planet. And yes, in 2021, still uh, some people like to write a letter with a pen and paper. There's not only email. This could be computers, could be other types of electronics. It could be cars. It could be even bulkier shipments. Funny fact, every day on average, 200 resources are transported from place A to place B uh, via air. Although, if we consider uh, this uh, in terms of overall cargo with all modes, these 140,000 tons per day, uh, they represent roughly 1% of the overall uh, volume that's transported uh, uh, in general. And why is that? Because still most of the cargo is transported via water, so with a, a, a large uh, barges or via ground with, uh, with trucks. On the other hand, if we consider as the new proxy uh, value, now with air, uh, roughly 35%, I would say here, uh, now almost 40% of cargo is transported via air. And 
why do we have such a such a such a large difference? Because uh, for high value products, perishables, or more in general, all those products which are very time sensitive, which usually means they're very uh, valuable, air cargo is the only um, transport mode that ensures a seamless uh, connections uh, worldwide. So now let's let's look at the air cargo supply chain. So where does it start? Where does it end? Uh, an average air cargo supply chain looks like this. So everything starts with the shipper, so the person or the company uh, that actually wants to, 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 to deliver a certain, uh, certain goods. Usually uh, a shipper doesn't take care of the, of the process uh, by itself, but he or she relies on, uh, on professionals and these professionals are usually called freight forwarders. As the name suggests, they forward freight and they take care of uh, transportation in terms of bureaucracy and some parts of the actual transport from margin to destination. They also own warehouses uh, to, to, to stock uh, goods if they need to wait before uh, moving downstream in the supply chain. Uh, they interact a lot with, uh, with ground handlers. They are a different set uh, of warehouses uh, uh, located very close to the, to the airports. And why is that the case? Because they provide the interface between the land side, side of operations and the earth side. So in a ground handling facility, which is again a warehouse, uh, goods from freight forwarders are delivered. They are consolidated into, into larger and bulkier shipments, and we'll see in a bit uh, the specific types of those, uh, let's call them boxes for now. And ground handlers are uh, the people in charge of the loading of those uh, final boxes onto, onto an aircraft. Then we have the air transport phase. It could be one flight leg, so straight from the um, airport of origin to the airport of destination. It could be with one, two, three, uh, stopovers. Uh, this really depends on, on the, the, the due date of, the, of each product, on, on what's more advantageous for freight forwarders or many other factors. Once a piece of freight uh, reaches its final destination in terms of airport, the, the ground process is, uh, is reversed. So ground handlers say they consolidate uh, cargo, then freight forwarders come to pick up their own cargo and have it delivered to the final the recipient of each piece of cargo, who's also known as the consignee. And this being said, uh, it's quite easy to see that this is a multiple stakeholder supply chain. We have for freight forwarders, we have ground handlers, we have airports, we have airlines, we have trucking companies, we have uh, third and fourth uh, party logistics providers. We have different modes, ground and air, and we also have different aircraft types, which I'll be covering uh, in a bit. And if you're wondering why there is a red box between freight forwarder and ground handler in my, in my, in my flowchart, it's because I want to, to give you a bit of extra uh, piece of information on this part of the supply chain. And it could uh, look like this. Uh, basically, it's a pickup and delivery problem where trucks pick up goods from freight forwarders and have them delivered on the ground handler uh, uh, part, so at the ground handler warehousing facilities. It's also a scheduling problem because we have multiple trucks maybe uh, and they want to deliver to the same uh, warehouse, there might be congestion. And we also have a dock assignment because as you see in this figure, uh, each truck will be assigned to a specific dock to carry out the, the unloading of the goods uh, on board. In this figure, uh, what's even more interesting is some of the docks in the ground angling facilities are specific for special types of, uh, of cargo, like pharma and perishables. Why is that? Because most likely they need temperature controlled uh, uh, facilities or rooms or uh, other things. And if you're wondering how does the inner part of a ground angling facility uh, look like, this is an example. We have a lot of space, a lot of boxes, a lot of shipments, which they come as individuals and they are uh, consolidated before being loaded onto aircraft. And if you think about it, uh, also passenger operations entail some sort of 
logistics in, a, in this sense. In fact, there's always a, a lag handling, of course, for passengers. But uh, um, the passenger side misses all this extra layer of, of logistics, which is quite unique for 2 d cargo uh, supply chain. So, uh, after this uh, brief introduction, uh, what are some major differences between passenger and cargo operations? There's plenty, of course. The first uh, major difference I want to highlight is the uh, high directionality of, uh, of cargo flows. And for example, let me let me walk walk you through a, a, a small example. Uh, for example, in 2020, out of the 1.5 million tons of cargo transported from Latin America to Europe, uh, roughly uh, three quarters, uh, let's say 70, 77% were perishable. Among those, for example, the avocados you use for your uh, avocado toast or your homemade guacamole, flowers and fruits and veggies uh, more in general. If we consider the opposite flow, so from Europe to Latin America, still the, the, the commodity with the highest percentage, if we exclude other, which is a bit generic, is perishables, but that goes down to 17%. This implies that perishables mostly fly from Latin America to Europe, but not the other way around. And the same consideration applies very well to many other commodities. For example, uh, the amount of electronics um, moving from Asia to Europe is not comparable to the amount of electronics uh, moving from Europe to Asia, which means that the production and the destination regions of uh, many goods or many commodities they usually differ. This is not the same for passengers because unless you move permanently to a different location, which, which happens of course, the vast majority of passenger flows are bidirectional. If you go to a certain place, eventually it could be the day after, it could be one week after, it could be after six months, you will be going back to your uh, origin. The second uh, difference regards the size and shape of the commodities that are transported. For passengers, of course, there's luggage. They, they can have variations. I'm not saying they are very standardized, but there's quite some standardization in terms of al allowed weight and volume. In addition, every passenger per se contributes equally uh, to the occupancy of the aircraft. Uh, in, in the same, uh, uh, when we consider the same um, cabin class, of course. A business passenger, for, for obvious reasons, occupies more space in the cabin, but uh, for example, every business passenger counts as one passenger within the business uh, uh, class fare. For cargo, this is not true. For cargo, we can have commodities as small as a few grams of a certain uh, chemical substance. We can have uh, F1 cars we can have large mechanical components or even a T-Rex uh, skeleton, which was actually carried by uh, KLM. Uh, this entails an extra layer of decisions regarding how to properly pack items of such different shapes and sizes efficiently and falls under the, the broader category of uh, beam packing uh, problems. The third difference uh, I want to, to show you or to, to, to describe to you is the value of time. As passengers uh, don't like to, as passengers we don't like to, to wait. Uh, whether if it's you know before entering the airport, maybe en route to the airport, or at the check-in at a security checkpoint, or of course during a transfer. This gets even worse if our flight gets delayed or gets cancelled. On the contrary, Cargo is generally relatively insensitive to the time it spends, for example, in a warehouse waiting to be consolidated and brought to the, to the airport or waiting to be picked up by the freight forwarder to, to, for the final delivery to the, to the final user. Of course, uh, this is true as long as the due date of a certain uh, shipment is, is, uh, is satisfied. Uh, of course, this is not always true. Uh, so this is the case where we have maybe general cargo, it doesn't matter if it stays in the warehouse, but we might have cargo which actually needs to be properly 
control the monitor uh, all the time and the, the shorter the, the, the trip, the better. This is again, for example, the case for perishables, also because they might need specific equipment in terms of temperature or storage. And this can pose an even uh, a greater challenge in terms of routing and inventory options. So I mentioned uh, beam packing problems. I want to show you the two uh, beam packing problems that um, are part of the uh, air cargo uh, supply chain. Uh, the first one is how to properly assign shipments to unit load devices. If you don't know what a unit load device is, which is fair, uh, maybe you don't know the name, but it's something you've already seen many times when flying. These are, for example, unit load devices. And now I think most of you can relate to, to, to this. They come in two types, and these are two types. On the left side, that's called a pallet. A pallet is no more than a metallic, a slate. I mean, sometimes you see them with wood, but for air, air cargo operations, usually they, they are metallic uh, slates, where boxes are just piled and then covered with a net for stability. The second type, which is represented on the right side, is called a container. So they're closed metallic boxes uh, that can, of course, contain uh, shipments. They generally have a corner which is cut off, in that case the lower left, in this case corner. And why is that the case? Because in this way they can better follow the, the fuselage when they are loaded onto the, onto the aircraft. And uh, you might be wondering, so why would I choose between a pallet and a container? What are the advantages and disadvantages of the two uh, ULD types? Uh, pallets, they offer more weight and volume and more flexibility. Uh, in the sense that shipments can even slightly ex exceed the, the, the base. You, you don't have necessarily to, 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 uh, to occupy the base and that's it. Shipments can slightly overhang, that's the technical term, uh, outside the, the actual uh, pallet. Of course, uh, as, you, as you might guess, they offer little protection against uh, external uh, factors. So, for example, against unwanted impacts with the fuselage or other objects, because there's not a, a, they're not a sturdy container uh, uh, preserving them. And this is, of course, on the other hand, an advantage of containers because they are metallic physical containers, so they offer more resistance against unwanted uh, interaction with other uh, objects. In addition, uh, containers are, are the only ULDs uh, capable of uh, properly storing uh, uh, very perishable or very temperature sensitive products because they can be equipped with uh, sensors and actuators so that you can uh, monitor the status of your very perishable uh, products. And uh, there could a, there, there's a, a lot of research on, on this topic actually on how to properly and efficiently, optimally, hopefully, load shipments into uh, different types of, of, uh, of ULDs. Because in terms of modeling, this is a fully 3D beam packing problem. Uh, each box comes with, a, with three dimensions. Each ULD comes with three dimensions. How, how can I uh, basically play, play Tetris? And something like this can be done. This is actually, um, this, is, this figure is taken from the master thesis of a former uh, auto student. And, uh, it might look simple, but 3D beam packing is actually a very hard uh, problem in optimization because it entails uh, many constraints, apart from some, some which might sound obvious. We have incompatibility between items. Maybe you cannot have a radioactive and perishable item in the same ULD. We have gravity, which may, might sound trivial, but uh, since it's a 3D problem, you cannot have you know, shipments uh, levitating uh, on top of others. You need to make sure they are exactly put on top of other shipments if they're not on the ground. And uh, similarly to, to this, you want to make sure that items do not overlap with each other. So we, we have boundaries given by the, the, the shape and volume of each, of each uh, shipment. The second beam packing uh, part of the game is now the assignment of ULDs to the, to the deck of the aircraft. 
and uh, um, basically what I mean here is given a certain aircraft type there's a predefined and finite set of uh, configurations uh, in terms of ULDs. Uh, given the same aircraft you can have a certain number of pallets if you want to use only pallets or you can have fewer pallets and the remaining space can be taken by containers and basically uh, how do you pick which is the, the, the optimal configuration this is also um, an optimization problem of course you want to to load as much as you can usually that's a good proxy of efficiency if you can uh, uh, load more weight that's good but there are other constraints which uh, need to be accounted for one which is very peculiar to this problem is weight and balance and with weight and balance i mean that you want to make sure that when you position your ulds you do not change the position of the center of gravity of the aircraft too much because that would that could have uh, repercussions on the stability and more of the on the performance on the on the aircraft while flying a simple example is if you put all very heavy pallets on the right side and all light pallets on on, on the left side you might have um, uh, issues with uh, that would be with rolling stability i would say so it, it's, it looks trivial, but it's actually a quite complicated problem to solve in an efficient way. And again, uh, this is another figure to show you how the, the loading is actually carried out. I'm already showing a very specific type of aircraft, so I'm already spoiling one of the next slides, but uh, this is how loading ULDs onto an aircraft uh, might look like in, uh, in practice. Since I was mentioning types of aircraft, so uh, how many types of aircraft uh, uh, can we use for, for cargo? Uh, we basically have two types. The first one is pretty common. You've all flown, I guess, at least once, maybe not in recent times, but at least once on a passenger aircraft. In this case, uh, of course, the main deck is occupied by passengers, but we have a lower deck, which in jargon is called the belly space of the aircraft, where, of course, your luggage goes, but there's always some space for other cargo. And this is an example, I guess this is from a Korean uh, Airlines uh, aircraft. And in passenger aircraft, uh, passenger related cargo, so luggage and stuff, always has priority, which means that uh, uh, this makes an accurate prediction of the uh, space actually available for cargo difficult. On the other hand, we have the second type of, uh, of aircraft, which is full freighters. And uh, a full freighter is an aircraft that is entirely dedicated to the transport of cargo. So there's no passengers on board. Actually, sometimes there's a few. I think in, in some full freighters, there's up to six seats for, uh, for passengers. And this is the case for, for example, extremely high value cargo, where you want either a, let's call him or her a bodyguard or somebody actually on board, making sure everything goes smoothly. Um, so there's some passengers on a few, um, on top of the crew, of course. Still, there's no fully automated uh, full freighters. And they, the big ones, they can carry up to 140 tons of uh, cargo on a, on a single flight. So I talked about aircraft. Now let's talk about airlines. In terms of airlines, we have mostly three types. The first one is combination airlines. So they are airlines mostly dealing with passenger uh, uh, operations, but they also have a small uh, fleet of uh, full freighters. An example could be KLM. And here, uh, the advantage of a combination airline is they can rely both on the belly space of their more or less extended passenger network and on full freighters. The second type is full cargo airlines. As the name suggests, they are specialized in cargo operations and as such they only employ a full freighter uh, fleet. Finally, we have integrators. Integrators are a special type of full cargo airlines with the main difference, where the main difference is that they also offer the ground services, while a full cargo airline are, only takes care of let's say the airside part of the journey, 
integrators, they take care of a shipment from basically shipper to consignee. And as I mentioned, KLM, for example, is an example of, uh, example of a combination airline. Cargo Lux is one of the major full cargo airlines. It stems from uh, Luxembourg. That's the Lux part of the, of the name. And finally, for integrators, um, we have uh, the, the usual suspects, so FedEx, UPS, and DHL. Uh, if you note, if, if you noticed it, I didn't mention um, basically airlines that uh, only offer uh, passenger operations. And with that, I mostly mean uh, low-cost carriers in this context. And why is that? Uh, because usually they never consider carrying cargo because it wasn't deemed profitable for them. Not because they didn't have some space in their belly, but because, as we saw, transporting cargo entails an extra layer of logistics, which maybe low-cost carriers are not interested in, in paying for or in using. Uh, this has changed in, re in recent years, at least for some major low-cost carriers such as Southwest. So, for example, Southwest has started in a few years back offering some cargo uh, services on top, of course, of their uh, passenger uh, services. So, uh, now let's dive on some differences between full freighters and passenger aircraft. Uh, what is better to transport uh, cargo? Why would I uh, go for a full freighter rather than uh, the belly space of, of one of my uh, uh, passenger uh, aircraft? Again, uh, this is not an easy um, question to, to answer. Uh, here I'm reporting some advantages of full freighters over uh, of over passenger aircraft as reported by a, a cargo report from Boeing by uh, from 2020. Um, there's five, there could be more advantages, of course. The five main advantages they, they listed are as follows. Uh, first, uh, being dedicated cargo carriers uh, or being associated to dedicated cargo carriers, uh, full freighters can basically better cover uh, key cargo trade routes that are maybe not interesting from a passenger uh, perspective. In addition, uh, having a dedicated fleet provides uh, different restrictions in terms of minimum turnaround and connection times. Uh, small uh, passenger aircraft cannot carry pallets, for example, but usually pallets are the preferred option by freight forwarders. S uh, related to this point, but this is for every passenger aircraft, uh, the belly space cannot be used for hazmat or project cargo. So some very specific commodities by definition cannot be transported in a, a passenger aircraft uh, anyway. And finally, we can have payload range considerations on passenger aircraft that might limit the actual amount of cargo you can transport. And uh, if, if you want to transport more cargo, maybe you need to give up on the range, but uh, uh, you cannot always give up on the range if your main goal is to transport uh, passengers. So, it looks like full freighters are uh, quite the, the, the big players in air cargo operations, but still, more than 50% of your all air, air cargo is transported in the belly space. So, indeed, uh, uh, the passenger network still provides quite some, quite some uh, capacity, right? Uh, so, as you might guess, like in every course dealing with air transport, eventually I'm bringing up the COVID topic. So what happened during the COVID? All this 50%, actually all this more than 50% of capacity for some months just disappeared, right? Because mm, during the worst months, basically there was no air transport uh, at all. And to, 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 I want to show you two plots. The one on the left, they, they are taken from the same Boeing report I was uh, describing before. The plot on the left uh, shows the ATKs, which stands for available at tons kilometer, which is similar to the available seat kilometer uh, KPI you, you saw for passengers uh, between January and October 2020. And you see, and as you see between March and April, there was a huge drop in, uh, in wide-body passenger uh, belly space, 
due to all the restrictions we are very well aware of. On the other hand, for full freighters, you see an actual increase in, uh, in basically capacity. And why is that? Because full freighters during COVID, well, during, with, they're still COVID, but uh, uh, freighters were capable of partially absorbing some of the, the, the demand, which uh, was left unattended by the, by the belly space, which was not there. And for, for the same reason, on the right side, uh, basically we see the major winners of this situation. So express carriers, basically integrators, all cargo carriers, while every mm, airline uh, mostly focused on, on passenger operations just lost a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of points in the, in, the cargo, uh, in the cargo game. But this brings, also me, brings me to the last slide of this first part of the lecture. So uh, what did uh, combination airlines do during COVID? They just waited and they decided to do nothing? Actually, no. Um, they decided to do something uh, smart to some extent with their grounded uh, uh, passenger aircraft fleet. And they decided to offer uh, basically to, to transport cargo with their uh, passenger aircraft, not only in the belly, but in the main cabin. Since they couldn't transport uh, passengers, at least they decided to, to, to transport uh, cargo. And that's where this term freighters, which is a portmanteau for passenger and freighter, was, uh, was depicted. And here you have two examples. Uh, on the left side, there's one option to carry out a freighter operation, which is simply to put your boxes or your cargo on top of your seats. On the right side, we have an even more extreme case, which is if you really feel like you have a lot of cargo to transport and still passengers are not an option, why don't you strip the, 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 the seats from your main cabin to, to, to increase the space available for, for cargo? So these are two options that, of course, now are uh, being phased out by many companies, but still a few airlines are still employing part of their passenger fleet for uh, freighter uh, operations. And with this, uh, the first part of the lecture is concluded. And in the second part, uh, as mentioned before, we'll, we'll deal uh, with, a, uh, with a fleet assignment model for uh, cargo operations.